Hello and welcome to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. And you have found the place where we talk about estate planning, elder law, real estate, and business law. So give us a call, why don't you? 616-774-2424. That's 616-774-2424. If you have a question, a comment, or concern. Yeah, questions, comments, and concerns. About wills, trusts, or probate. That's that's what we call estate planning. All right. So if you're wondering about that stuff, well, give us a call. 616-774-2424. If, uh, if you're wondering, how do we beat the high cost of long-term care? Because, you know, it is the Christmas season. We are getting uh, towards that winter uh, the winter solstice uh, and all that good stuff. And birth of Christ and all. Um, and this is a time between Thanksgiving and Christmas where a lot of people start thinking about family, right? And what are we going to do with mom? What are we going to do with dad? There's a lot... <laughs> You know, whenever they stop talking, when you come in the room, that's what they're talking about. Just word to the wise. Anyway, if you're uh, if you're having that conversation, if you're afraid that your kids are having that conversation, well, give us a call, 616-774-2424. You don't have to go broke, you know. You don't have to. I know that most people do. I get that. Uh, but long-term care doesn't have to be, uh, does not have to be uh, devastating financially. And it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be as bad as they uh, as bad as they make it out. If you have a question about that, just give us a shout. 616-774-2424. Of course, if you're looking to buy or sell real estate, which uh, with the crazy interest rates, what are they like eight percent now? Uh, how do we go from under two percent for an adjustable rate to over eight? I don't know, but here we are. But now, you know, it's an ill wind that blows no one any good because for some folks. Uh, if you're on a fixed income, what have you, if you've been looking at 2% or, you know, 0. 0.00, you know, 9 or 9 or whatever it was on CDs, and now that now it's actually starting to be so, like some real interest rates, you know, that's uh, that can be a good thing for some folks. Uh, the borrowers, though, who, and guess who's the borrowers? Guess who are the borrower, borrowers? The answer is all of us. You know, that uh, trillions of dollars that was just the, the giveaways? I mean, think about it. If you're going to give away like a trillion dollars, and that's what they're talking about. That, that's seriously what they're talking about. Uh, instead of people paying back in interest on a trillion dollars of student loans, just take student loans, for example, trillion dollars. That, 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 that's kind of big, right? Isn't that kind of big? Isn't that kind of big? That's, you know how many aircraft, that's 100 aircraft carriers. Think about it. The new aircraft carriers, they only cost $10 billion each. Only 10, which is half as much as we sent to the Ukraine so far this year, right? We sent 20 billion over there in the last year, right? That's two aircraft carriers. Yeah, who needs aircraft carriers, I guess, right? Um, but anyway, you know, they're all complaining. Oh, it's so expensive. It's so expensive. Eh, well, it's half as much as we gave those guys. What the hey? It's not that expensive. Anyway, long story short, um, when we're thinking about interest rates and we're thinking about all this stuff. Um, if you bar now, now, of course, the whole point of the student loan giveaway was to get those people to vote and it worked. You know, all the surveys indicate it worked. And now, of course, they don't talk about it anymore. <laughs> Suckers. <laughs> they got what they wanted out of you. And now see you later. Because, you know, if you've got 5%, right? Let's say it's 5%. Let's say because government borrows money for cheap, right? Let's say it's 5% uh, that they're borrowing the money at, okay? A trillion dollars. What's 5% of a trillion? What is it? Is it 50 million? 500 million? Billion? Billion? I'm sorry, it's billions. You know? Where's that money going to come from? Oh, I guess we'll borrow that too. It's, it's nuts. It really is. Uh, it really is unfortunate. But, you know... That's what that's what you're talking about. That's why that's why the student loan giveaway will never happen, I think, um, because you can't. Somebody's got to pay the money. See, this is this is what this is what flabbergasts me. It's like nobody gets that somebody's got to pay the money. Santa Claus ain't showing up with that much in, uh, you know, ducats, shekels, or you know, whatever. 
dollars. No, it doesn't. It doesn't work that way. So anyway, if you voted based on getting your student loans uh, wiped out, <laughs> the joke's on you, brother and sister. Anyway, um, so but if you are wondering, hey, how do we buy sell real estate now? I mean, the interest rates are going up, aren't they? Eight percent, I heard. So uh, how do we how do we do that? You want to, you know, the the effect of interest rates on prices and building activity, boy, isn't that pretty obvious now? I mean, for the longest time, it, people denied it, but uh, this is why house prices are coming down. This is why the deals aren't getting done anymore. This is why the uh, building materials are, are are flattening out. You know, the, the prices are uh, are starting to come down because nobody wants the stuff anymore because it's too dang expensive. There you go. Anyway, we also deal with business law. So if you're looking to start, stop, keep a business humming along, now's the time to give us a call. As I have uh, mentioned before, we're... Uh, uh, big fans right now, there is an opportunity for business owners. If you kept your business going during the pandemic and you kept your people employed. See, some people think this is just a free money giveaway. Well, it's another free. <laughs> well, the idea was during the pandemic, hey, if people keep, if employers, if business owners keep their folks employed, then we don't have to pay the unemployment tax on them. You know, this would be, uh, this would be a good thing. Right. Uh, and that was the uh, that was the concept that if, you know, hey, keep these people working or at least keep paying them because we won't let you work. See, that was the other thing. We're not going to let you work because you can't, you know, you got a social distance. You got to do all the rest of the stuff that kind of breaks up your business. Yeah. OK, that's true. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you if you do keep them employed, even though they're not, you know, even though business is totally disrupted and nothing good is happening, right? But if you keep them employed, um, then we will uh, give you tax credits. You know, we'll, we'll give you back some of the money. And in 2020, seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Long time ago. 2020, the max was $5,000. 2021, the maximum was $21,000. And so you see a lot of these people out there say, oh, get $26,000 for employee. Doesn't work like that. You had to keep them employed. You had to pay them. Okay, this is not this is not uh, free money out of nowhere like PPP was. Uh, in fact, which was kind of free money out of nowhere. This is you kept your people employed, right? You didn't make them go to unemployment, you know, the unemployment insurance, uh, and you kept your workforce intact. Good for you. Here's twenty six Gs. If you paid them a certain amount of money. Uh, and there was an interaction with the PPP because if you got the freebie money that fell out of the sky, uh, that was the Paycheck Protection Program. If you got that money, then you can't double count it. You are eligible. See, this is the thing. People say, oh, I got PPP. I don't qualify for the uh, employee retention credit. Uh, the fact is you do. And like any tax thing, you know, it's so freaking complicated that people just shuffed it off. Eh, well, forget about it. You know, it's too hard. Well, it's still available. And one of the things that we've been doing is getting a lot of folks their, their PPP. It turns out to be a surprising amount, especially when there's a recession on, especially when the interest rates, you know, have gone through the roof. It's, it's turned out to be a real, um, you know, real benefit, real godsend for, uh, for a lot of folks. But it's an old program. You know, it's, it's one of those things where you actually have to go back to the pandemic. Well, how can you go back to the future, right? Well, the answer is you amend your tax returns. You know, that's what we do. Uh, that's what we've been doing for uh, for lots of folks. Uh, we've gotten, I don't know, and this is coast to coast. I mean, we're doing nationwide. Uh, but we've got about a thousand of them done now. And, um, you know, we haven't gotten a lot. <laughs> we haven't got a lot of money back yet. The IRS has taken so darn long. But that's just, that's just the way that is. So if you are running a business, if you know somebody running a business, and here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. I'm just going to, this is between you and I. Okay, don't don't be passing this around. What if you your business failed? What if, or you sold your business, right? You ran it during the pandemic. You tried to keep it going, but that was the, you know, shot through the heart. You know, that was the end of it. And now you've sold it for cheap or what have you. You can still get the tax credit. Eh? You can still get it. You went bankrupt, but you kept the corporation. 
or you sold it for cheap. Like I say, you sold it for cheap, but you kept going, right? Maybe, you know, I'm, I've seen quite a few of these where folks, uh, business owners, uh, basically hollowed out the business trying to keep the folks employed. You know, because frankly, in small business, and this is a small business thing, um, under 100 employees, under 500 employees. Anyway, um, you know, they go the extra mile to keep their folks employed. You know, they were looking for the pandemic to be over in a reasonable time, not as long as it took. But anyway, even if you sold your business, if you kept the corporation, which most do, right, you're still eligible for this tax credit. I know it's goofy. I know it. You know, you went out of business. You lost all your money. I get it. It's still available. So give us a call. 616-774-2424. There's lots of ins and outs to it, but... It's a payday at the end of the day can get you uh, where you need to go. Even if, even if you were driven out of business by the pandemic, there might be some relief for you. It doesn't hurt to find out. At least I don't think it does. You've been listening to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. Welcome back to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. Like I say, this is the... You know, we're getting to that point, end of the year, where people are thinking more about family. What are we going to do next year? All that kind of thing. Not a bad time uh, to be revisiting. You know, what is the plan anyway? Um, just to be be real clear about it. And we just did, uh, been doing some workshops down in the uh, down in Portage. You know, by down by Kalamazoo, a little bit south of Kalamazoo. Uh, beautiful senior center over there. Incidentally, they just opened it um, this summer. Um, so many people, I mean, it really is very, very vibrant place. And, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the course never runs smooth, I suppose. <clears throat> so anyway, we, uh, uh, we had it set for one o'clock, but they were like, well, you know, that's our Christmas party there. Uh, could you come at two? And it's like, and when did they tell us the day before? Right. And then we get there and somebody's doing a, somebody's got something else going in and half the space that we had reserved. So. Anyway, everybody got cozy. It worked out fine, but uh, it's one of those uh, one of those things, you know, where people you gotta have a little you gotta have a little good humor during the uh, during the season. But the uh, the questions, frankly, haven't changed. I've been at this be thirty three years. Hard to believe, right? I uh, founded the firm in nineteen ninety, so it'll be uh, thirty three years come uh, come January. Uh, it's sort of amazing to me, but the the questions haven't changed over the years. Uh, not significantly anyway. Uh, people still get older. People still wonder what's going to happen with their family. People still uh, do all those things. And they still have, people still have, and by people, I mean you, uh, <laughs> still have the same uh, misconceptions or <clears throat> misinformation or whatever you want to say <clears throat> about wills and trusts and how it all works. Um, it's the same, you know, you keep getting the same questions about, well, what's the difference between a trust and a will? And listen, that makes perfect sense, frankly, uh, because why in the world, why do you care? When you get to that point, I guess it becomes it becomes relevant. Or if you're um, if you're working uh, to administer an estate or something for a loved one who passed, it's it's significant, right? But for thirty three years now, almost thirty three years, not quite. Um, my whole thing has been. Who's worried about probate? Like, why would you worry about probate? And the answer is there's all kinds of good reasons to worry about probate. There's all kinds of ways <clears throat> that you don't want to go through probate. All kinds of reasons why you don't want to go through probate. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but the thing is with probate, it's not, See, probate is not evil in and of itself, right? Probate is just the way, just the core process by which we figure stuff out. See, if you haven't figured it out, right? If you don't do a trust, for example, right? And you die and you have stuff in your name and you have stuff in your name, it goes through probate. That's how it works. Probate is there to clean up the mess. If you don't make a mess, because you got beneficiary designation. People say, oh, I got beneficiary designation. I said, great, wonderful beneficiary designations. Have you really thought that through? Well, of course not, but you know, you got beneficiary designations. You're going to avoid probate. And if avoiding probate was the whole thing, well, okay, you avoided probate. I guess that's good. 
The problem is not avoiding probate. The problem is how do you get what's left of your stuff? Number one, make sure there is something left, I would I would say. Uh, and then how do I get it to the people who are still alive? Because this is after you're dead, right? We get that part, right? After you've died, where does the stuff go? How do we get it to the people you want to get it? Now, maybe probate's the way to do that. And in fact, in fact, if your spouse is in long-term care, right, going through probate, you don't actually go through probate, but we involve the probate court, uh, is the way to protect the assets for the spouse. It's the one time we'll go to probate, we'll go to probate on purpose, is when we're protecting assets for the surviving spouse. That's the one time. And you got to do it just right. But when you do, then it really works out well for the surviving spouse. But you see, that's the point. We're always focused on who do we leave behind? Who is still here, right? You got leftover stuff. You got leftover money. You got leftover real estate. You want the cottage to go to a certain place, okay? If that's what you want, right? Is avoiding probate a good idea? You're darn tootin' it's a good idea. It's a good idea, not because you're avoiding probate, but because you're accomplishing the goal that you wanted to accomplish. You wanted to leave your stuff to your kids. You wanted to leave your stuff to your spouse. You wanted to leave your son stuff to, I don't know, cousin Charlie. Well, whoever, give it to the church if you want to, all right, or a charity or what have you. That's completely up to you, okay? And avoiding probate is a good way to make sure that what you want to have happen actually happens. But it's not simply about avoiding probate. Okay? You don't get a you don't get a, a gold medal, you don't get a star. Oh, you avoided probate. Here's a, you know, St. Peter says, uh, did you avoid probate? Yes, I did. Okay, come on down. Uh, I don't think it works that way at the pearly gates. Okay. It, the, it all this stuff has to do with what's still going on on this side of the Great Divide after you've died, the whole avoid probate thing. And of course, and I'll get into this in the next segment, that's not even the important part, okay? Like everybody's all focused on what happens to my stuff when I'm gone, right? Oh, I want to avoid probate because uh, that'll help me get my stuff to the people I want to get it to. Well, yeah, yes and no. Yes and no, there's, there's positives, there's negatives, right? Just avoiding probate is not going to work. It is not going to get you where you where I bet you, where if you, uh, see, this is why we do these workshops, right? We do the workshops because it's like, okay, here's how it works. Here's how these things go. Mm -hmm. Is avoiding probate important? It's important as a means to the end. It's important, probate is important to get you where you want to go, but it's not where you want to go. You know, they say, oh, the journey is the destination. No, it ain't. The journey is how you get from here to there and you want to get there, all right? So avoiding, is avoiding pro, sorry to be, uh, sorry to be uh, repeating this too much, but, but it is, it's kind of important to get the difference between, oh, I want to avoid probate. That's one thing. And, oh, I want to accomplish my goals. That's the second thing. And I would totally agree, 100% agree that avoiding probate, right, is important most of the time to accomplishing your goals. But let's keep our eyes on the prize, shall we? What is it we actually want to accomplish? You've been listening to The David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. Welcome back to The David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. And of course, this is the place where we talk about estate planning, elder law, real estate, and business law. If you have a question, comment, or concern about wills, trusts, or probate, you're wondering how do we beat the high cost of long-term care? Well, 616-774-2424. That's the number to call, 616-774-2424. Uh, and we'll get your question, comment, or concern on the air. That's right, lickety split. And uh, if you're listening to KZO, yeah, it's 616 area code, I know. But uh, you don't have long distance anyway. So, you know, it's all free. Give us a call, 616-774-2424. Uh, 24. Now we were just talking about, I was just talking about, uh, <laughs> and if you don't want to hear me talk about it anymore, it's easy. Call me, right? And we'll talk about something else. But uh, you know, this idea that avoiding probate is the key. And 
listen, avoiding probate is not that tough. Give your stuff away. You want to avoid probate? Just give it away. Give it away right now. Okay? I mean, it's dumb for lots of other reasons, but it would avoid probate. You know, if that's your if that's your big deal, I mean, if you think that's the, the be all and end all of this stuff, just give it away. I mean, have done with it. Um, or put beneficiary designations on everything. That's another thing people do. You know, beneficiary designation basically on your house, on your car, your boat, you know, whatever else it is you want you want to do. You could do that. Um, you know, avoiding probate, not that big a deal. Okay. Now, it's a good idea to avoid probate in order to accomplish the goals that you want to accomplish. Like what? Well, like actually having your beneficiaries get the stuff you're leaving them. Right? Frequently, people do not get the stuff. Frequently, they don't get the stuff you're leaving them for all kinds of reasons. And the big one is it ain't there anymore. It ain't there anymore. Why? Because you needed long-term care. And nobody wants to hear this. It's shocking. I'm shocked. Not really. Anyway, of course, nobody wants to hear it. Who wants to hear about long-term care? Blah. I mean, it's only a thing that affects almost everybody, right? Almost everybody in at age 65. This is according to the government, all right? This is not, um, not Dave Carrier making this stuff up. I make up plenty of stuff, sure, but not this. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's um, when you're 65, you have a 70% chance of three years of long-term care. Skilled care is what they say longtermcare.gov. Go to the website, look it up. You'll see, I didn't make it up. I've published this a number of times in the newspaper, you know, if you read my stuff in the newspapers. Um, you know, I've cited to it, go look it up. Don't trust me. Don't believe me, right? Well, now, now you see, now I'm going to tell you, believe the federal government. I'm, I'm not sure that's a great, <laughs> I'm not sure that's such a great idea either. But anyway, um, that's, where you, that's where you find it, longtermcare.gov. Uh, that says on average three years, 20% of folks, five years or more. And that's all kinds of skilled care, right? That's your spouse taking care of you. That's going to assisted living. That's going to skilled nursing. So it's all kinds, right? It's not, oh, you're going to be in a nursing home for three years. I'm not saying that. What I am saying though is as we wind it down, you know, as we start shuffling off this mortal coil, as Shakespeare said, at least I think it was Shakespeare, uh, <laughs> as we're moving on over the great divide, right? Well, you need more care. It's just as simple as that. Okay. And that's where your life savings go. You know, if you wondered what you were saving the money for, the answer is the nursing home, which seems totally bogus to me. Seems wrong to me. Seems to me that the folks who worked and saved and did all the good things, you know, I was talking about that tax credit, right? The people who kept working. Remember, it was very, very easy not to work during that pandemic. They give you an extra 300 bucks a week uh, in the um, unemployment. What was that about? I don't know. Was it 300 bucks? Was it 200? I don't know. It was some ridiculous amount of money, right? You had a lot of folks who all of a sudden made a lot more money. And I'm talking to business owners every day uh, with this tax credit thing. And so many of them, it's like we lost everybody. We couldn't keep the, we couldn't keep people working because of the unemployment was so, was so uh, out there. It was so, it was so generous, you know, as they might say. So, my point is, you worked, you saved, you did all the good things. Why go broke at the end? Why not use your money? Why not use what you have to benefit the people that you love, the people who are still here, the people for whom money will mean something? Now, money's not going to mean anything to you, right? Whether you go to the good place or the bad place. <laughs> if you're in the good place, you can't buy anything extra, right? <laughs> if you're in the bad place, you can't buy a drink of water. So. You know, so forget about it. Don't worry about it. You can't take it with you. I am reliably informed. So let's figure out how to make the best use of it while it's still here. While even if you're not here, how do we still uh, leave that best for the kids or the charity or the whoever, whoever it is you want? You know, there's no there's no entitlement to an inheritance. There isn't. But we're in a tough spot. We're in a tough world tougher than it has been, tougher than it was for you and me. Right? I wouldn't want to be a kid growing up today, right? which is no excuse not to have kids, frankly. I mean, who, who's going to solve the problems if you don't have any kids? But it's tough. It's tough. So, okay. So is there something we can do to help out? Mm, maybe. Maybe if you weren't broke, you could. 
Maybe if the state didn't take your house after you died, if it goes through probate, maybe you could. I can explain that if you'd like me to. 616-774-2424. Be more than happy to explain exactly what I mean by that. Okay? So let's focus. Let's keep our eyes on the prize, which is the family after you're gone. First of all, first and foremost, take care of you while you're here. Yes, absolutely. We want to do that. And in order to do that, we have to avoid going broke. And how do people go broke? Well, try pricing out long-term care these days. It is ridiculous. More, it was worse than ridiculous. It has skyrocketed like you won't believe. You think it's bad enough what they're paying, you're paying for a loaf of bread? Long-term care is worse. It's worse because there's, you know, there's more and more people who need it as America gets older and America is getting older. Right? As we get older, there are not as many young people as there used to be. That means there's not as many people to provide uh, services. All right, so let's figure this one out. Hmm. There's more people who need something, and there's less of it. There's more older people who need care, and there's fewer younger people who can provide the care. Hmm. I wonder what would happen to prices. <laughs> what would happen to the price of care if the demand goes up and the supply goes down? Hmm. Hmm. Let's think about that one. How long does it take? 10 seconds? Five seconds? All right. That's what's happening right now. And in people who think, oh, I'll get the lady from church who helped out with mom. Hey, the lady from church is getting care right now herself. All right. That's the, the old ways of things not around. And people people some, tell me, I just had somebody say this. It's like, well, my parents lived to 90, so I don't think this is going to happen to me. Okay. You know, who am I to argue? Right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Keep on whistling past the uh, the proverbial uh, graveyard, you know what I mean? Or the whistling past the nursing home. This stuff happens. It will happen to you. More likely than not, much more likely than not. And you either deal with it or you don't. And that's why I want you to call 616-774-2424. And we can explain exactly how this stuff does work. How for 33 years now, you know, we've been making sure that the rules work for the people who play by the rules. If that's you, well, probably is. That's why you listen to this wonderful radio show on Sunday mornings. 616-774-2424. We are doing the uh, life plan workshops. We're back in full swing on those. Uh, and they're full. I mean, it's really, uh, I, I don't know what happened. Maybe it was the election. I think people put stuff off because of the elections. I think that that really gets folks worried. I think it does, rightfully so. Um, but now the uh, the workshops are full. And it looks like, as far as the eye can see, we'll be having you know quite a few folks in there. So if you'd like to come to a workshop, we do a lot of these. Uh, it's sort of an outreach thing. It's, um, you know, we don't uh, we don't hide the ball on you. We tell you exactly, as we do in the show, tell you exactly what's going on and what you can do about it. You've been listening to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. Welcome back to the David Carrier Show. I'm still David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. And we're talking about what? State planning, elder law, probate, all that. All that fascinating kind of stuff. Well, I suppose we could talk about other things. But uh, in order for us to talk about other things, then you have to give me a call. Wouldn't you? 616-774-2424. And then we can talk about other things. In the meantime, though, we're talking about number one, avoiding probate. What's so great about avoiding probate? Well, avoiding probate helps you get where you want to go. Right? It's not a good thing to avoid probate in and of itself. You know, I mean, people say people talk about avoid probate like it was the like it was the holy grail. Well, no, it's not. I mean, it is a good idea. I'm not I'm not arguing with it. And of course you avoid. Pro of course you do. You know what I mean? It's that's the, that's the table stakes. Now, most estate planning does not avoid probate. Most estate planning and I mean, trust estate planning. You know, I've had three attorneys now go through the course and it's the same answer every time. Um, the trust fails, but that's okay because we have a will that puts the stuff in the trust. Despite the fact that the trust has failed, despite the fact that it didn't avoid probate, that's okay. You know, and then of course they blame you. They blame the client for the reason that it uh, that it failed, which is like 
Oh. It, I don't, it just it just boggles the mind. But there you are. Um, you know, if you had a process, if you if you were at work and you fail ninety six percent of the time, or even I don't know ten percent of the time, let alone almost a hundred. You know, if you always failed, wouldn't you get fired? I mean, wouldn't you wouldn't you say, hey, let's stop doing that? But it doesn't work that way with estate planning. With estate planning, you know, the fact that you go through probate is a is a feature. That's a good thing. It's not a bug. It's not a problem. Well, from the attorney's perspective. And besides, you've gone on to your reward and you don't even know about it. It's the kids who have to pay. It's nuts. But And if you want me to explain that, I'm more than happy to. I'll go chapter and verse on it. You know, and, and, and what's the consequence of it? Well, if you look at... Uh, I don't know if you voted in the last election, but in Kent County anyway, uh, we just got ourselves a new probate judge. If everybody's avoiding probate, and that seems to be the mantra, right? Avoid probate, avoid probate. Lady Bird deeds, all this stuff. If everyone's avoiding probate, what do we need a new probate judge for? Huh? And we do need a new probate judge. It's, 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 it wasn't optional. You know what I mean? The legislature doesn't just create judges for no good reason. There's a lot of things for no good reason, but that's not one of them. That's not one of the things they do, right? We needed a new probate judge to keep up with the volume. Simple as that, right? Well, well, why? Why when all these, when everybody's avoiding probate? The answer is they're not. That's not reality. The reality is most cases, most trusts go through probate. That's the reality. They don't avoid probate. Just saying. Okay. Anyway, then that's not even the big deal. You know, the stuff, what happens to your stuff after you're gone, that's not even a big deal. Uh, it seems to me that given the way Americans age, the way, you know, up in Canada, they figured out a good way to, a good answer to long-term care. Do you hear about this up in Canada? Right? It started out, they, they legalized uh, suicide, right? Or, uh, you know, physician-assisted suicide, whatever they want to call it. You know, it's suicide is what it is. They, they, uh, they legalized it. Not long ago, and now it's one of the leading causes of death. You know, it's in the top ten. <laughs> uh, they've got they've got stories. There's one person up there who, whenever a veteran, a Canadian Army veteran, says, "Hey, how about a wheelchair? Hey, how about a ramp?" <laughs> they say, "Hey, how about some pills? <laughs> These will kill you. You must be depressed because you don't have a wheelchair ramp. Here, here's a cure for your depression: death." Well, I mean, look at what happened in the Netherlands. You know, in the Netherlands now, it went from, yeah, once in a while, to uh, they kill people and, and they didn't even consent. I mean, look it up. I mean, don't, don't trust me on this stuff, please. You know, oh, Dave Carrier said so. No, that's not a reason. You know, the reason the reason to believe it is because it's accurate, because it's true. And it's, there's plenty of information out there on it, right? So... If you think that death is a good answer to long term the long term care problem, well, okay, I guess. Uh, not for me, not for my dad, no. And if you're going to do it, wouldn't it be nice not to be broke? Well, yeah. And is there a government program like Social Security, like Medicare, that provides for that? The answer is yes, Medicaid. But guess what? You got to apply for it. You got to do the work. But if you do the work, if you do apply for it, then your life is better. You don't go broke, and you can leave it on to the kids. Okay? That's that's basically what we're talking about here. It's what I've been talking about for, you know, 30-plus years. All right? How do we make sure that you stay in charge? And, you know, this is a common thread. This is the thread that holds it all together. This is why we talk about real estate. Why? Because it's not enough just to take whatever somebody wants to give you. You got to look at it. You got to figure it out. You got to say, hey, I want to have... A chicken coop. I want to do this. I want to do that. Whatever it is, you know, and let's figure out based on, you know, we're, maybe we're doing land contracts. Maybe we're doing something else. Let's figure out how to get you the best advantage. Same way with the business law. Okay. You know, you can't ignore government. You can't. Be nice if you could. I don't even know if that'd be nice, but <laughs> but you can't anyway, right? You know, if you're going to have a house and you got to obey the rules, because if you don't, they'll drop the hammer on your head. No surprise there, right? If you're going to run a business, oh, my God, do you have to follow the rules? 
Yeah, you do. And most of those rules are not, not what you want to deal with. Most of the rules, most of the time. They're not for your advantage. But every once in a while, every once in a while, it's unusual, I know, it's weird and strange, I know. Every once in a while, things work out in your favor. You know, it's like the community chess thing that you get on uh, on uh, when you're playing Monopoly. Bank may is error in your favor. Oh, my goodness. Right? It works out. That's what this employee retention tax credit stuff is about. Right? That's what Medicaid is about. If you plan ahead, right? If you do, if you're aware of what the situation is and you act accordingly, right? Things work out much better than if you shut your eyes tight, stick your fingers in your ears and say, yeah, 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 government bad. I'm not going to do anything, any of it. Now, you can't stop people from doing that. And most people do. Now, that's just the reality of it. Most people stick their fingers in their ears. They don't want to know. They don't want to hear about it. Nothing I can do. You know, you know, horse water. There, hey, horse, there's the water. You lead the horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Very true. All right. We can show you how this stuff works. More than happy to do it. That's why we do the workshops. That's why I have the show. All right. Here's how it really works. Oh, I don't want it. Okay. You know, who am I? <laughs> who am I to say that you do? Who am I to say that you want to hang on to your life savings? Besides, the government's so much smarter than you anyway. They know exactly what to do with your money, and and that's the good thing. Give the money to the government. Uh, don't get any benefit from your tax dollars, and uh, uh, leave your kids. You know, don't leave anything for your kids. That's all good. Oh, and by the way, go broke yourself. Oh, and you have a spouse. Well, yeah, too bad for them, I guess. Really, really, that's how you want to do it. That's how you want to play this game. Maybe, maybe. It's the way most people are playing it. It's unfortunate. But if you give us a call, 616-774-2424, 616-774-2424, you know, we'll tell you how it, exp we'll explain to you how it works in your situation. Not legal advice, not legal advice, got to say that many times. But this stuff works every time you work it. And it never works if you don't work it. Simple as that. You've been listening to The David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. Hello and welcome to The David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. And now is the time to give us a call, 616-774-2424. That's 616-774-2424. You're always welcome, of course, to go to the website, davidcarrierlaw.com, because David Carrier has his very own law. That's right. <laughs> Okay, not really. But uh, well, it would be nice if I did. Anyway, uh, I don't. But the website is called davidcarrierlaw.com. And you can always email me, david, at davidcarrierlaw.com. And uh, we'll get your question, comment, or concern on the air. Uh, first hour, we're talking a little bit about um, you know, the uh, uh, tax credits and this and that. That's still available if you're a small business owner. Most people don't realize. Even if you sold your business, even if you sold your business, if you kept the corporation or the LLC, which is how it's usually done, you just sell the assets, you're still entitled. You say, well, wait a second, I haven't run that business in two years. It doesn't matter. Uh, those tax benefits still belong uh, still belong to you. Um, but there's lots of stuff like that. You know, the Medicaid is stuff like that where people don't realize the degree to which your tax dollars, and this is all money you put in. Remember, where did this money come from? Uh, you put it in. That's where it came from. I mean, it's your tax dollars at work. If you want someone else to get the benefits, I can't stop you. Uh, but if you want to get the benefits yourself, well, then maybe we can help out. We've got uh, Kevin on the line. Hello, Kevin. Welcome to the David Carrier Show. Good morning, David. Good morning. How can I help? Good morning. Uh, yes, uh on the radio a few weeks ago, I thought I heard you say something about a professional trustee, finding a professional trustee, and I wondered, is, is there such a thing, and uh, how does one go about finding that? Part oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, professional trustees can be a real real handy, and I'll tell you what, on every, every single time, unless the client really seriously objects, which they don't, but every time when we do a lineup, you know, so you say, hey, I want my spouse. I want my older kid, then the youngest kid, then the middle kid, 
or I want my brother or sister or whoever uh, to manage things for me, non-professional trustees. So you put your family members on there, that, that'd be pretty typical. You don't have to, but it's pretty typical. Um, we always put a professional trustee as the final backup because if I don't have a backup, if it's a natural person, right, and I run out of family members, well, now I'm going to probate court to ask the judge to appoint somebody. Well, I don't want to go to the probate court to ask the judge to appoint somebody. So that's why we always put a professional trustee in. That's what we do every time. Now, nobody else does that, but, you know, we're different. So that's one thing. The other is I don't really want my kids to do it. I would rather have a professional trustee. And there makes a lot of sense, right? So what you need to do when you're evaluating a professional trustee, the first question you ought to ask is, um, what is your average uh, average case? What is the average net worth of your clients? So if you're dealing with like Mellon Bank or if you're dealing with JP Morgan or you're dealing with Fifth Third or you're dealing with one of the big places, you know, you're looking at millions of dollars typically uh, is an average case for them. So if you've got a few hundred thousand or even a million, eh, you're small fry, you're small potatoes. Um, are they really going to do, is their trust department there going to do the job for you uh, with the same uh, eagerness or professionalism? I'm supposed professionalism, but you know what I mean? Are you going to get the service that, or your family going to get the service that you would really want them to get? Um, my experience has been no, uh, you know, with the, with the bigger places, you don't get a, you don't get a real dedicated trust officer. You get a trainee, somebody who's going mm. through their 90 days of trust stuff. Um, I, and I'll, t I'll just tell you my big fan, I'm a big fan of West Michigan, West of Michigan community bank. Uh, we've been dealing with their trust department for mm -hmm. years okay. now. And, you know, have you heard of them or? Oh yeah, yes, I uh, I'm familiar with them. I think they're in um, Hudsonville, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, they're headquartered in Portage. Yeah, okay. But they got they've got branches up uh -huh. and down the lakeshore, and um, yeah. you know we we've just been real. You know, they got one in uh, downtown Grand Rapids. You know, uh, we've been real happy with them. Um, okay, so I think if uh, I think I follow you so far very well. Uh, and when you use that phrase professional trustee, you're talking about the institution then, not not necessarily a named individual first and last name. Well, it could be uh, like um, for the longest time, there was a uh, um, there was one fellow who was doing it and then he got bought out by one of the or merged with one of the large law firms downtown. Here's what I would say. Here's what I would say. Don't use a lawyer. OK, uh, lawyers always want to be trustee, okay. but it's not it's not in the skill set. You know what I mean? It's not in a little, and I'm sure there are lawyers who, who do it fine. I, I was, I was a trustee one time. Um, I agreed for a, a mm -hmm. client who's a Korean war vet who didn't like his family. They didn't like him. And he, he just wanted me to do it. So I, I went along with it. Um, but I'll never do it again. I'll tell you that much. Um, yeah. it it's not for more of a layman kind of person. Let, let me ask you this. Since you sure. brought it up, um, when you talk about the, um, probate court appointing a trustee mm -hmm. what's the process or who do they finally end up with when they appoint one yeah so what happens is the the beneficiary typically the beneficiaries of the trust if there was a trust um they'll go because when you've got a trust then you've got trust you gotta you gotta name a trustee um it's not optional it's not yeah. the personal mm -hmm. representative so then you petition the court and you say hey court uh, i would like to have so and so be the trustee of the thing and then you have to give notice to everybody okay. and then you have to have a hearing and then the judge okay. has to approve the fee schedule, et cetera, et cetera. I've seen these okay. things cost as much as ten, fifteen thousand dollars um, you know, when the big guys mm -hmm. are doing them, uh, because they document you know, they overpaper everything in my opinion. But, you know, it, it can get to be a fairly expensive thing, which is why I always put one in, because it's gonna be a professional trustee at the end of the day anyway. I might as well have it be someone mm -hmm. in whom we have confidence. And it completely wipes out, you know, otherwise we'd be in probate court half a dozen times a month, you know, um, sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, I think the average is probably once or okay. twice a month, but sometimes you get a rush, you know, and rather than clog the probate court with that kind of thing, by putting them in, now you've protected it. And if you put them in, and this is what we always do as 
the financial power of attorney and the backup is a financial power of attorney, then you still get the value of the uh, power of attorney, even though uh, you don't have uh, you don't have a family member. And that that is important. That mm -hmm. is important because um, there's things you can do with a power of attorney you can't do with a trust. You know, and you just blow off so the it trust. Sounds like a process for me would be sounds like a process for me would be starting by looking at banks, and it sounds like the bank doesn't have to be called Central Bank and Trust. They don't have to have the word trust in their name. But no, they don't. No, other, uh, a bank any name. I beg your pardon. So it could be a bank by any name that just oh has yeah a trust function that they're yeah. part of their uh, wheelhouse. There yeah. you go. Not a not a credit yeah. union. You can't have a credit. You know, a lot of people want. There's a very popular. Yeah. You know, like Michigan Credit Union. People always. Oh, I'm with like Michigan. I'm like, sure. but they're a, they're a credit union. They can't do. They don't have trust powers. You know, mm -hmm. in the in the trust department, okay. you know, they're supposed to be very separate. You know, they call the Chinese wall between the trust department and the commercial banking. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? To maintain part in, impartiality. You know, and independence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. but yeah, there's no okay. there's there's no substitute to talking to them, get a feel for them, for sure. Yeah. All right. So the bank can't do it; they'll tell you. I mean, oh they, yeah, they just say they'll know. We don't do that. Right. Okay. And if you don't have yeah, enough, yeah. Thank you. if you don't have enough, they'll tell you that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so when it's all said and done, there's no reason not to put them in the succession of trustees down the list. It's free insurance. See, here's the thing. Yeah. If you put them as the as tail end Charlie, the chances are they'll never get yeah. there. Your kids will actually do it. Yeah. But if if you do get there, then you just save yourself a trip to probate court. So why wouldn't you? There's no there's no yeah. obligation. Yeah, right. There's no fees. There's no nothing. Okay. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, Kevin. Have a good have a good one. Okay. Okay. Sure will. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Merry Christmas. You're listening to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, uh, your family's personal attorney. When we get back, we've got Tom on the line regarding how to cover the cost of long-term care. Welcome back to the David Carrier Show. I'm still David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. This is the place where we talk about estate planning, elder law, real estate, and business law. We've got Tom on the line. Hello, Tom. Welcome to the David Carrier Show. Good morning, David. Good morning. Uh, I just have a quick question regarding long-term care, how to pay for that. Sure. Um, just as a background, uh, we did work with you last year. Um, we completed a root seller trust. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So we have our assets in there. Um, yeah. I'm still, I'm just, uh, I'm 65, so I'm signing up for Medicare. And my question was, um, what parts of Medicare do I need to have enforced to be eligible for this possibly this long-term care later down the road is part a sufficient or i need more than that no you really don't i mean once um uh you hate to say medicare is optional but when it because it's because <laughs> i wouldn't advise that um but you don't uh, once you're on the see most folks who do the plan like you did uh, or what we call dual eligible. So you're eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, dual eligible. That's the that's our goal. Okay. Um, but anything that isn't picked up by um, by Medicare, whatever Medicare it is you have, then we're looking at the Medicaid. We'll we'll pay for that. But I'm not going to okay. advise. I'm, I'm not going to advise you to uh, skimp on the Medicare um, because the Medicaid that's the long term care solution, right? So you've got a you got twenty years, man. You know of knee replacements and stents and God knows whatever, right? Um, when you need the long term care, and of course you might have six months. Who knows? But but the point is, when you need the long term care, that's when uh, that's when the Medicaid kicks in, right? But in the meantime, for your sort of day to day acute care needs, that's what Medicare is for. Okay. And like every tool has its purpose, every every program has its purpose. Let's use all of them uh, to the maximum extent possible. You've already paid for it. Uh, you're the one who does pay for it. So, you know, so I wouldn't I wouldn't skimp on the Medicare. I would, you know, 
do the part A, you get the part D, which is the prescriptions, of course, um, and all the rest of it. You know, definitely, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't not um, pick up part of unless unless you got some other um, like like um, some retirees. Um, GM was used to be the example uh, where uh, retiree health care was part of the deal. It's not anymore, but it was. And so for those folks, you know, rather than go with the Medicare uh, other than Part A, um, they would rely on the um, on the retiree health care. Well, that's a thing of the past, but and now they're using Medicare. But you, you never want to give up on a on the government benefit that you already paid for. Okay. okay. Well, the reason I I ask this is because I'm self-employed. I'm still working. Uh, uh, insurance is what I have in lieu of insurance is I have a direct primary care doctor plus I pay in health share ministry. So I'm oh, okay. Money directly to other people with bills. I really like this system. Uh, it gives me a lot of flexibility. Um, and I'm just weighing my options. Do I want to give that up? Just opt into Medicare and who knows what you know the rules are going to come down with. Maybe they're, maybe they're not going to have to limit it in the future for costs. Maybe they will. I don't know. But uh, right. But I, I, I guess I I was advised I need to make a decision now, go one way or the other, and stick with it basically. Well, the thing is, if you if you don't if you don't enroll in Medicaid Medicare <clears throat> when you can, you know, if you don't enroll right away, then your premium goes up for the rest of your life. Yeah. So that's why you want to that's why you want to enroll. And when you're still employed and you're covered by another plan, you know, you got to click the boxes. But you can you can do that, you know, and you can amp it up later on. It's just that you got to do it now to lock in the lowest possible mm -hmm. Medicare premium. Because they figure if you if you sign up later, then you're only signing up because you're sick now, and we didn't get your money from before, yeah. so we got to make it up on you. Yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. that's what's going on there. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, I did plan on at least getting part A, but maybe I should get more than that. So thank you. You betcha. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Take care. Yeah. <clears throat> Are we really down to two minutes? No. Okay. Um, let's get to one of our uh, questions here. I have a question about residency in a home. My sister has been letting a friend live in my father's home for well over a year. Hmm. I am concerned about this. Well, why wouldn't you be? As far as I know, he pays no room and board. He, uh, and I've asked several times, when is he leaving? I know he doesn't like me going over there anymore and has told my sister I'm trying to control and manipulate her. My father is, how do you know that? My father's 91, has dementia, and refers to this person as his good friend. Everything is in my sister's name, and she has the power of attorney. This was at my request, and she's always cared for my parents. As far as I know, everything's still in sister's and father's name. I don't really trust him. I don't trust him. I don't blame you. And I'm doing what I can to make sure his name doesn't wind up on anything. Any questions I put to my sister get discussed with him, and as soon as he finds out they come from me, they get shut down. I've always, how do you know all this? Um, I guess sister's telling him anyway. Uh, I've also been told he's leaving for several months, more than once, but he's always back within the week. Just wondering if he can do anything just by being in the house for as long as he has. Thank you. Well, no, he can't do anything just because he's been in the house. Um, that's not your concern. The concern I would have, uh, the reasonable concern, it seems to me, is that sister... I don't know, puts them on the deed maybe or bank accounts or something. You know, that's a real that's a real possibility. Now, sister acting under the power of attorney has an obligation to account for whatever it is she does in dad's best interest. OK, um, understand, too, that you can't get rid of the guy. You can't just say you're out of here. He's a tenant at this point. He's been living there long enough. OK, he's not a guest. And in order to get rid of him, you're going to have to evict him. You're going to have to go through the, the whole eviction uh, scenario, you know, serve him with the notice to quit. If he doesn't leave all the right. But sister has the power of attorney. Sister, dad has dementia. OK. And sounds like he's kind of declining at this point where he would not be able to perhaps he would not be able to revoke the power of attorney. He's not competent. OK. 
then what? Well, now we're off to the races, aren't we? Um, we've got, is it a boyfriend? Is it just a friend? I don't know. Who knows? Um, in the house with sister and with father. Uh, how are we going to defend father's interest? Are we going to make sure that dad's okay? Uh, especially when, when there's sort of a negative thing going on uh, between you and this, um, you know, you and this other guy. And, and the fact that he's there a lot <clears throat> is concerning. You know, he lived while well, he lives there, right? So, I mean, this is how people get into uh, situations they'd rather not be in, frankly. Um, it's one of those things you're just going to have to uh, have it out with um, with sister. But just because he's been there for a long time doesn't mean he is entitled to anything other than other than the eviction process uh, when it gets when it gets to that point. OK, so he is entitled to be evicted as opposed to, you know, put his stuff in the garage and change the locks on the door. You can't do that. Um, but that's about the uh, that's about the only thing that he's getting as a, as a resident in the home. Um, you know, in some states, I think there's six or seven of them where if your sister were holding out that she and this guy were husband and wife, then after a period of time and, the, and it varies. Michigan's not one of these states, but like in Rhode Island, if you can believe it, they have what's called common law marriage. Um, and then if it's in sister's name, then it's in this guy's name, or at least he'd be entitled to some extent. But you don't have that issue. Um, <clears throat> still in all, uh, it's one of those things you need to have it out with sister. And if she's saying that he'll leave and then he doesn't, well, you have to have that out as well. Um, because and now's the time to be doing it. Uh, the time to figure this stuff out is not after dad dies and now you're presented with with a bunch of things that already happened. You don't you don't ever want to be in that situation. So plan ahead. That's the answer. 616-774-2424. Come to a life plan workshop. We'll show you how it works. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. Welcome back to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. And uh, we're just hitting up some of our email, emails, getting clearing out the backlog here a little bit. Um, who can revoke a durable power of attorney? Now, if you want to get your own question on the air, boy, we would like that. 616-774-2424. And that's how you, uh, that's how you do that. 616-774-2424. And we'll get your question on the air. But in the meantime, you have to put up with someone else's questions. So... Yeah, that's why. Who can who can revoke durable power of attorney? Mom has my partner's mom has had cognitive decline for quite some time and was diagnosed with severe dementia. He holds durable power of attorney and has been acting as power of attorney. And it's not it's a pet peeve. OK, the power of attorney is the document. Right. The person who acts under the power of attorney. That's what we call the attorney, in fact, or the agent. OK. So he holds a durable power of attorney. That's okay. Uh, and he has been acting as agent or he's been acting as attorney, in fact, for more than a year. Uh, recently, he received a suspicious email from the trust attorney stating that his mom revoked all his power um, back in the day um, before the diagnosis. Also, he spoke with this attorney over the last month. The attorney stated no changes had been made. Is this something that can be revoked by mom with dementia? And is an email appropriate notification for something like this? If there was a change. Can he challenge being revoked? Well, um, it's different, okay? With a healthcare power of attorney, even if you're not competent, even if two doctors are certified in writing that you are not able to make healthcare decisions for yourself, you can still revoke the healthcare power of attorney, okay? I know it sounds crazy, but, but you can't. Uh, different with the financial power of attorney. When you've done a financial power of attorney, like the whole point of doing the financial power of attorney was so that someone would be able to make decisions for you while you were not competent. Okay, while you were not competent. And that's with regard to property, with regard to stuff that's a little less sacred or whatever than life. I think we can agree on that. I hope we can agree on that. So the idea is that to the extent you can make yourself understood, you can change you can revoke you can't name anybody you know if that's your mental state um you can revoke a power of attorney for health care 
but you cannot revoke a financial power of attorney or a trust or take any other action if you're a legally incapacitated person. But even if you are legally incapacitated, you can still do things like get divorced uh, or married uh, and uh, make decisions with regard to health. Well, you can't make healthcare decisions, but you can say, I don't want that person doing it. And then it flips it back in the probate court for guardianship. Okay. So if the question is, and, and in this case, it's kind of suspicious, right? Because the diagnosis, I didn't give you the dates. The diagnosis was severe dementia was the same day as the revocation of the power of attorney. Well, excuse me, if in the morning, uh, excuse me, if in the afternoon you've got severe dementia and you can't act, well, what are the chances are you were able to act in the morning? Not very good, it seems like to me. Can you challenge this kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, if mom's not competent, you then you can challenge the revocation on that basis. Uh, but in order to do that, you're off to the races. Okay, you're you, you know you're going to be talking to a lot of attorneys. That's the deal. Let's see. Uh, um, this was one we did in the newspaper. So if you want to see the the written version of this, just um, it's in the newspaper. Uh, can my stepmother, who has rights to live in the house till she dies, pay lawyers and take money out of dad's estate? There is no will. There's no will. So sibling, uh, when a sibling took uh, mom and dad, stepmother, to drop a will years back. Stepmother said she didn't want it. She wanted everything that dad had. She told him that day she could divorce him and take half of everything. She moved out for a week. When I got, the letter writer here, got the power of attorney. And he put beneficiaries on his bank accounts and investments, leaving her enough to live on. And he added her to the deed to live there till she dies, then reverts back to his three previous children, three kids. So what's going on here is dad is deciding, hey, I'm going to put wife on this account and this account. I'm going to put my kids on these other accounts. Not the preferred way of doing it, but okay. And then I'm going to give mom a life estate or stepmom wife a life estate in the house. Okay, this is where he says, okay, I'm going to deed you, I'm going to deed to the wife an interest in the house so she can live there as long as she's alive. And if she's doing that, if she has a life estate, then she cannot what we call commit waste. Waste is pretty extreme. Uh, waste is when you let the house go to rack and ruin, okay? And if they're not paying the taxes, if they're not maintaining the property, et cetera, et cetera, then you can go to... Uh, then you can go to uh, court and enforce, you know, make her avoid the waste. But right now we've got Mike on the line. Hello, Mike. Welcome to the David Carrier Show. Oh, good morning. Thanks. Sure. Uh, yeah, I have a question about portability on some of this planning and so forth between states. Okay. I'm 67. Uh, I'm, I'm right now I'm residing in Grand Rapids on a home. But I'm thinking that sometime after I retire, I haven't made a decision yet, on moving back to the state of Wyoming. Okay. So how much would be portable between states? I know the will isn't. I'd have Gosh. to get a new will when I, if I go back to Wyoming. Well. But how much other things like uh, care, trust, et cetera? Gee, Mike, that's really, uh, that's really weird and unusual, moving from one state to another. Come on. Nobody does that. This is the first time I've ever heard of such a thing. <laughs> Florida, North Carolina, Arizona, <laughs> Texas. Yeah. No, it, it happens all the time, right? And one of the things that uh, that the founding uh, the founding persons, the, five, the founding parental units, the founding fathers gave us in the Constitution was something called the full faith and credit clause, meaning that if it worked in another state, it works in your state. And if you go to Wyoming and you say, I want Michigan law to apply to this, then the Wyoming court has to apply Michigan law. So here's here's oh. the thing. Yeah, yeah. We're, you're not moving to Acapulco, okay? It's not when you go to Texas or Wyoming. So so the, the thing is, th those documents still work. But like let's take example what i specialize in right which is how not to go broke and so until until 2006 until february 8th of 2006 
when they passed the Deficit Reduction Act of 05, because they meant to pass it in 05 and they screwed it up and didn't pass the 06. But anyway, the Deficit Reduction Act of 05, they made, they took away from the states a lot of the flexibility that the states had used with the Medicaid rules. And they they said, okay, it's not three months over here and 10 months over there and this and that. Screw all that. Here's the deal. And they, they set out a framework that applies to all 50 states. Now, California still ignores it, but that's because it's California. Everybody else has kind of fallen in line with the, uh, you heard the earlier caller talk about the root seller trust that we do. These are uh, what you call Medicaid divestment trust or a asset protection trust or discretionary trust. There's all kinds of words for it. But the point is that it triggers the look back period for Medicaid. You see, I don't want to give your stuff away, but I don't want them to count it either or either. And the way you do that is by one of these trusts, which triggers, if you've heard of the 60 month look back, the five year look back, it triggers that. Now, until 2006, February 8th of 2006, um, you were at the mercy of whatever Department of Health and Human Services felt like doing tomorrow. Okay. Now we're, we've got to uh, we've got to go to a break, but I'll wrap this up, Mike, when when we get back. Fair enough. Okay. No. All right. So we'll be we'll be right back. You're listening to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. Hear that? It's that big branch right above your roof. Is it ready to snap? Prepare for fall with Bartlett Tree Experts, providing professional tree care, helping homeowners and businesses maintain beautiful, healthy trees and shrubs. Proper pruning techniques are essential to long-term tree and shrub health. Thinning and reduction pruning helps lower the risk of damage during storms. Proper root and foliage care also improves insect and disease resistance. Bartlett is available all year round. To schedule an inspection, go to Bartlett.com. You know what cooler temperatures and the feeling of fall means? It's uh. the perfect time to get your trees in shape with a little help from Bartlett Tree Experts. Proper pruning is critical to the long-term health of your trees and shrubs, and proper thinning and reduction pruning can reduce the risk of storm damage. Bartlett Tree Experts have provided quality tree trimming and removal services for over a century. They are the ones you can trust. Visit Bartlett.com to schedule an inspection by a skilled arborist. That's Bartlett.com. This is your personal attorney, David Carrier. And if you're like me, the government is a monster that swallows tax money and spits out potholed roads. But if you're open-minded, maybe not all of your tax dollars are wasted. If you're older, have COPD, CHF, or other health issues, there are truly helpful programs you must know about. Get free help now. Email me, david at davidcarrierlaw.com or call the David Carrier team, 888 888- Go David. This is your personal attorney, David Carrier. In this coronavirus pandemic, that personal aspect can become problematic. But the David Carrier team is here for you as we have been for the last 30 years, keeping promises, delivering security, trusted to get the job done. Get free help now. Email me, david at davidcarrierlaw.com or call the David Carrier team, 888-GO-DAVID, 888 463 2843. If you run a small business, you need the most from every investment. That's why Comcast Business gives you more. Like more innovation with our new gig speed Wi Fi, plus unlimited data. More speed from the largest, fastest, reliable network for small businesses. And more savings, up to 60% a year with Comcast Business Mobile. All from the company that powers more businesses than any other provider. When you need more, you need Comcast Business. Powering possibilities. Get started with internet and advanced security for just $40 per month for 12 months with no annual contract when you add mobile. Plus, ask how to get a $750 prepaid card with a qualifying gig bundle. Ends 1 1 2023. Restrictions apply. Actual speeds vary. Compare pricing of top carriers. Requires eco bill and auto pay. Comcast business internet required. New Comcast business 100 megabits per second internet and security edge customers only. Equipment taxes and other fees extra and subject to change. Must add mobile within 90 days of internet install and keep services for 12 months for discount. Results vary. Not an endorsement. 
A year ago, there was not a bad investment to make. The stock market was still showing growth. The housing market was on fire. Cryptocurrency was something you were flirting with, maybe. What a difference a year makes. The bubble may have burst on not just one of those investment angles, but all of them. I mean, who knows? But what I do know is that gold and silver may turn out to be the safest, most reliable investment there is. Certainly over time, that's been proven, particularly when markets are volatile. I find value in purchasing real gold. Gold is good. Gold is solid. And gold is the key to making sure your investments are on solid footing. I rely on the Oxford Gold Group for my gold purchases. They're the industry leader for so many reasons, starting with their advice and the best pricing guarantees. Call them yourselves to diversify your portfolio. Call the Oxford Gold Group today and request your free precious metals investment guide toll-free at 833-404-GOLD. That's 833-404-G-O-L-D. David's perkin and working and taking your calls now. This is the David Carrier Show. Welcome back to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. You have found the place where we talk about estate planning, elder law, real estate, and business law. So give us a call. Why don't you? 616-774-2424. You can be like Mike. Mike gave us a call, and he's wondering what happens when I uh, move to uh, Wyoming or parts west when I uh, when I retire. Should I do an estate plan now? You know, that kind of thing. Am I catching it, Mike? Is that is that sort of the question? Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious on, on how to set some stuff up uh, as far as portability between states. Yeah. So the good news is that full faith and credit means that your trust works wherever, and they have to relate back. They have to look back to the state where you came from to decide what law to apply. Now, that can be important. So Michigan has this thing that you can put in the will right, where it's only available in one other state. And if you go to Wyoming, right, they don't have it. But you might want it, this particular thing, which I'm not going to get into, it take too long. But but the point is, you can say, hey, Wyoming court, if you're on the, if your family's on the ball, and say, hey, we, we specifically said Michigan law applies under Michigan law, Wyoming court, hey, court in Wyoming, probate court in Wyoming, Michigan law says, you know, whatever it is. And the Wyoming court has to do that. That's under the uh, full faith and credit clause of the of the Constitution. That's why you can buy something in California and they'll still deliver it. You know, that's how Amazon works, right? Because you can buy it in California and you can take them to court and and force them to, to, uh, to uh, perform their contract. Now, good luck trying to do that with some countries overseas, you know? Now you gotta go, it's a mess. But because... You get a judgment in Michigan, you can enforce it in California. That means that the whole country kind of works together. It's really a very positive thing. Now, when you do move, if you do move, one thing that I always tell folks to do, the will still works. You don't, you don't have to give up your will. And besides, if you're using the will, then that means you're in probate court, right? Because the only place a will works is in probate court. Well, you're already there. What the heck? Might as well make the, have the lawyer make the argument, right, it, as necessary. The one thing that I always advise folks to change, and I think it's a very good idea to change, is your health care power of attorney. Because with the health care power of attorney, uh, seconds count. You don't want the EMTs trying to puzzle out, oh, uh, can we do this? Can't we do this? So that, you know, or be subject to like uh, somebody thinks that if it's from Michigan, that it doesn't work or anything. Just do a new one. Just do a Wyoming healthcare power of attorney. So that when you're bleeding out in the car wreck, right, or whatever, um, then the EMTs will recognize it as a local healthcare power of attorney, and they won't have any problem following it. Do you, do you see? But that's the right. one thing. Well, no. Go that ahead. raises another question. Uh -huh. uh, what about the uh working in the opposite direction. What if I have a family member uh, back in Wyoming and giving them medical power of attorney? Does that work here in Michigan? Oh, sure. Sure, sure. Because you can have somebody from, yeah, I mean, 
You can they could be in Timbuktu. Uh, you got a Michigan healthcare power of attorney, so long as we verify that that is the person and they are acting under the uh, designation of patient advocate or healthcare power of attorney, that's fine. I mean, we've got all kinds of folks who are out of state, you know, acting under the Michigan power of attorney because you're in Michigan, assuming that that's the case. Right. Yeah, that's not, a, I mean, having people outside the state, that's no problem. Outside the country, that's no problem, right? And these things, and, and my, the point I was making earlier was these, um, the Medicaid trust that we're doing, the long-term care protection trust that we're doing, because back in 06, they changed the rules and they said, okay, here's the rules for all the states, then these trusts work in every state, you know, to, to protect your assets. So um, obviously we have, a, I don't know if it's obvious, but we have a lot of folks who are going to go to Florida, South Carolina, Arizona, you know, where it's warmer, that kind of thing. And, um, and these right. trusts work fine. You know, they work everywhere because they're based on, what is, well, yeah, what does the federal law say? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I, I wouldn't even ask, all I'd have to do is, uh, even in my will then, is just say, apply Michigan law. And I, pr I promise you, if it was done here, it says that. I, I would be, I would be shocked beyond belief if, if there's a, uh, anybody, well, I mean, I suppose you can download them that don't say it, but you know, if you're, if you did it with an attorney and it doesn't say, uh, you know, Michigan law applies to this because the estate and protected individual code, the, the Michigan probate code basically, um, applies, um, and all you have to do is say, I want it to apply. And there are real benefits to it. There, there's really some good stuff in there. So you do want it to apply um, to your documents. And all you have to do in order to take advantage of it, and this is what the law says, is, is say that you want it to. You don't need to show that, oh, I lived here three days out of the year. Or you don't have to do any of that, which we used to get all wrapped around the axle on. Uh, but now the state law just says, hey, if you want Michigan law to apply, say it. Now Michigan law applies. Boom. Um, you know, so when you have choice of law, because you get into that a lot, well, not a lot, but you do get into it. You know, is it who's which state law and different states have different rules if you don't tell them like in Massachusetts, it's what was the where were the documents signed? That's a very significant factor in Massachusetts. Well, it's not in Michigan, but it is in Massachusetts, you know. And in fact, th there was a recent case, if I'm remembering the facts correctly, where they, they said, I want Florida law to apply, but because it was executed in Massachusetts, then the Massachusetts court said, no, uh, Florida law is not going to apply. We're going to apply uh, Massachusetts law, because Commonwealth of Massachusetts, just because that's the way we do things since colonial times here in Massachusetts. So it's important to know what you're doing to make sure that you know, that the Michigan law does apply, but but under full faith and credit, every other state has to give credence to the rich judgments and documents that are done in other states. So, yeah, yeah, you're fine. There's no reason to put it off until you finally move. And the one thing that I do recommend people change, which is the healthcare power of attorney, uh, is more of a convenience thing, more of a, I don't want the Wyoming EMTs trying to puzzle out a Michigan healthcare power of attorney, let's give them a Wyoming power of attorney that they're comfortable with, that they're familiar with. And that's just a timing thing, not really a legal thing. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, because I'm, at this point, I'm going to probably, as of like right now today, I mm -hmm. will probably have a family member in Wyoming start acting as my healthcare power of attorney. Well, I'm yeah. still here. Yep. The one so thing I, I would I'm still covered that way. Yeah, the one thing I would say about that uh, proximity, like locality, doesn't matter with regard to trusts and the financial stuff because you've got plenty of time. The only time I think right. that the proximity matters, closeness matters, is with the healthcare, um, simply because if you've got one in Wyoming and one in Michigan, and it's a toss up, go with the one in Michigan because they can probably get to the hospital quicker. That's, that'd be my only thought on that. Okay? Yeah. Which is not to say don't use yeah. the one in Wyoming. I'm saying if they're better, use them. Oh, music means we need to get out. Thank you, Mike. Thanks very much for calling. You've been listening to The David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's 
personal attorney. 